talk to me. Broadcasting from San Diego and throughout the neighborhoods you live, it's time for Race and Sports Radio. Your connection to the world of race and sports. So huddle up as Race and Sports Radio brings you all the -the up-to-the-minute race and sports news, interviews, major stake race analysis, and handicapping races coast-to-coast. We're live from San Diego. Now it's time to talk the bottom line. It's time to bring you Race and Sports Radio. Here's your host... Felix Taverna. And a very happy day to you, each and every one of you. Welcome to Sports Kids as we talk about some of the issues and the dilemmas that are plaguing the youth sports movement across the country. I'm Felix Taverna. We are live in San Diego and we welcome you to our initial debut broadcast of Sports Kids. Inside the studio, longtime friend, childhood friend, going back many, many moons ago, Western Pennsylvania, Jeff Potter. Jeff, welcome to San Diego. Well, thank you, Felix. It's great being here. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. We it sure has. And you still got that left hand curveball working well. Well, a little, not quite like it used to be, but uh, I still get out there and throw the ball around once in a while. Let's talk a little bit about what you're doing, and I, I'm really intrigued with, you know, how you've been doing it. Uh, this show designed for some of the issues surrounding what's developing in the world of youth sports. And over the last several weeks, we've seen some big, huge, monumental situations develop. But bring us up to date or bring our audience up to date exactly what you do. Well, I've been uh, working with boys and girls for about the the last 10 years. I mean, uh, kind of, you know... uh, the things that I've done, I, I run a baseball tour in the summer, and I've done that for the last eight years, and uh, it's pretty much brought me back to my roots about working with kids and how important it is and really what's going on with youth sports and some of the uh, life lessons that they really need to learn. So when you do this tour, now break it down. We're going to get down to the the, the closest uh, uh, denominal uh, point of what you actually do now, you you have a total of how many kids on a on a yearly basis that you go on this tour? Well, we have about 20 teenage boys that go on this tour each year. And like I said, I've done it since, since 2010. Uh, the first couple of years we did the tour, it was mostly just baseball only. In other words, we wanted to get out there and, and play some baseball and have fun and go from town to town and kind of do like they used to do with baseball. Uh, the, the whole tour has kind of evolved over the last few years where we've gone from just playing the baseball and a few other sports to a lot of community service and charity work. We're going to talk about that in a, in a moment or two. So how many different cities? Now, you originate, now you live in Maryland, so the tour originates from Maryland. Yeah, I live in the Baltimore area, and that's kind of where it originated. Uh, the first year we had uh, 16 tour stops that we went to. Now we go over to over 30 towns each summer. 30 towns in how many different states? Uh, We're in about four states now. We go from uh, everywhere from Cleveland, Ohio to Virginia Beach, Virginia. And we also hit some places in Maryland and a lot of stuff in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm originally from, as you know, we're from Elwood, Western PA. So I I know a lot of people up in the area and we do a lot of tour stops in the Pittsburgh area. All righty. So now you have 20 young boys that all together go on, on this tour. How do you determine who goes? Well, it's first come, first serve. And a lot of people look at that and they, they think of the tour, baseball tour. Oh, this must be like showcase t- kids. I mean, really good baseball players. And that's further from the truth. We want kids on the tour that love and respect the game of baseball. They're not necessarily the best baseball players, but we, we want those type of individuals that uh, might uh, represent, you know, uh, the community service and the charity work and things like that and do things like that. So we basically, it's first come, first serve. If a kid wants to go on the tour, the first thing I do is I go visit them and their family and make sure it's going to be a good fit. All right. Transportation. How do the kids get around? How do you get around on your tour? Well, we use 15 passenger vans. We've done that for eight years. It's worked pretty well. Uh, it's it's a good situation. It's a lot of fun. Kids are together on, on the van. And like I said, we've done it for eight years, and, and it works. We, we take two or three vans, and we basically – you know, get up in the morning, we travel to another town, we do what we do, and, uh, you know, every day we're almost in a different town. So what prompted you to create the Potter Tour? 
Well, I, I had written a book uh, several years ago um, about, you know, it's called Whatever Happened to Baseball. And uh, the theme of the uh, book really was not only what's happened to baseball, but what's happened to us. You know, how we aren't what we used to be. We aren't the the community type of sports thing. It's not about the leadership and respect anymore. And, you know, it's all about the egos and the money and things like that. So I, I, I wrote the book. And, you know, after I wrote the book, I wanted to get a hold of a lot of people and let them know about the book. And what happened was I, I talked to uh, 16 different people uh, about a, a concept I had about barnstorming. In other words, in baseball, they used to call it barnstorming way back in the day. You'd go to a town, you'd have some fun for a day, you'd go out there and just have just for the love of the game. So I contacted the 16 different towns, hoping that somebody would say, yeah, come to my town, Jeff. It, it sounds like a great idea. Well, what happened is all 16 said, yeah, it's a great idea. So then I was in a situation where there were 16 towns wanted to come, and I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll hit them all. So that was kind of how the tour started, uh, kind of by mistake, you know. But we went to the 16 towns the first year, and after that, we, we've just grown it. So get real deep with me. What prompted you to write the book, and what did happen to baseball? Well, uh, what's happened to baseball and what's happened to youth sports in, in general, uh, it, it's, it's in chaos. I mean, it's absolute chaos. I mean, it's not anything near what it used to be. And as you can relate, me and you growing up, I mean, my goodness, baseball, sports, it was all about the community. It was all about playing each other. It was all about leadership. You know, we learned to, you know, play baseball by learning from each other. You know, there wasn't these instructors that you paid money to. There wasn't these high-paid, you know, coaches and, you know, the travel ball and everything is all, all about travel and ego and stuff like that like that now and it I could tell and I had a son that played ball and I could tell it was going the wrong way and I just uh, thought I need to say something about it boy has it gone the wrong way leading me into my next couple of questions there's so many issues and developments that surround youth sports and I had a, a bird's eye view and an opportunity to accompany a lady's son to a baseball game, a little league game, because she had to work till five o'clock. And she asked me, would you take my son to the game? And I said, I'd be happy to drive your son to the game. So I drove and I sat in the bleachers and I watched and I was in total awe. I was actually embarrassed about some of these parents. Well, it, it is absolutely terrible. And when you watch a game, you'll see, for instance, the dads, you know, they'll be yelling, they'll be screaming at their kids, do this, do that. I mean, the game is not the time for that. It, it's, uh, you know, that practice is a time for that and when when you go to the game you should have respect for the coaches like we used to do when we were growing up you'd never see parents questioning the questioning the coaches but now all the parents are up in arms their their ego it's it's just absolutely terrible we've lost respect for that well when i was at this game i i, I was in total uh, total disorientation to tell you the truth because i became very disoriented uh of of trying to figure out what actually was going on. The coach was moving Johnny to the right part of center field, and Johnny's father was in the stands telling Johnny to back up and move left. And I'm thinking, like, what is going on? Do you have any of those situations that enter into your tour? Well, the interesting thing about what you just said, I mean, I, you know, I talked to a baseball scout about four or five years ago, and we had a kind of a round talk discussion about baseball and where it's gone. And I, I asked him, you know, point blank, I said, what's the biggest problem you see with kids today? And he says, Jeff, they just don't have the instincts they used to have. They don't have the baseball instincts. And the big reason they don't have those instincts is they're so conditioned to listen to the coaches. They can't react until the coaches say, do this, do that. They're afraid of making mistakes. They're afraid of getting yelled at. So when they go out there, they're so conditioned to they can't do anything and use those natural abilities, you know, before the coach says something. And that's that's kind of the biggest thing that, that we see. Now, on the tour, because the type of individuals I have, the type of players just that love and respect the game, we don't play this high-pressured baseball. We play for the love of it. Most of our games on the tour are almost like pickup games. So there's no pressure for the kid to strike this kid out or beat this team or whatever. Uh on, on the tour, a lot of the kids will say, hey, coach, you know, I never get to pitch on my other team. Can I pitch? And I said, absolutely. You're on the tour. We're out here to have fun. We play hard. We try to win. But it's all about more like a pickup game, more of the love of the game. Jeff Potter is joining, joining me on 
sports kids on our debut show. Jeff and I go back a long way to Western Pennsylvania. He was a terrific left-hand pitcher. He uh, went to, uh, I think you were drafted by the Detroit Tigers, right? I was. Yeah, I got drafted out of high school by the Tigers. So. Wow. Yeah. Anyways, that was a that was a great experience going to. Tremendous uh, experience. Yeah, I went down to Lakeland, Florida and played a little ball with them. And, you know, obviously it didn't work up the way it I wanted it to. It never does for most of the kids. And that's kind of another life lesson kids have to learn about. All these parents think that their kid's going to play professional baseball, and that's just not the case. So if I was going to say to you that would you think that if 70% of the kids quit seventh grade, they quit going to school, that would be an epidemic? That would be an epidemic. But why are 70% of kids that age quitting sports? Well, they're getting burned out. They're getting burned out by the coaches, by the by the parents. Uh, the expectations are absolutely terrible. There's way too much, you know, basically showcase ball or travel ball. Everybody's a travel team now. And, you know, a, a dad gets upset at his, his team. He, he gets upset at the coach. So he calls a bunch of his buddies and says, look, let's start a travel team. And uh, we'll travel. So they now equate a traveling team as – we travel, and it's absolutely terrible. So that's referred to as a helicopter and lawnmower parents. Have you heard that term before? I have heard the helicopter parents, absolutely. And they lawnmower. They just go try to you know breeze on by you. Well, they do. And, and it's so easy to change teams now. That's one of the problems. Again, when we were kids, we played for a team. We played in a community, and that's what we did. You know, if you didn't like the coach, you had to learn to deal with it. And I, and I tell uh, parents now, like on the tour, we, take, we go to the tour, and these kids have never been away from home, and I take them for 31 days. And, and I tell the kids, you get on the tour, you, you don't like this other kid on the tour, you better figure it out. Because you go to college, you know, you don't like your roommate, you don't quit college because you don't like your roommate. But we've made it so easy in this society that if we don't like something, we just move on. And if a, and if a dad doesn't like the coach... He just starts his own team and goes to another team. These kids are constantly moving from team to team, and there's no consistency or loyalty. Must be some sort of telepathy running around here in this room because that's actually leading me to my next question. A situation took place in Washington, D.C. You might have heard about that. It's a little closer to your neck of the woods where a pretty coveted volleyball player uh, decided that uh, she didn't like the team she was playing on because the coach wasn't playing her in the position that she thought. And so her father actually sued the club team. Well, it happens more than than you would think. And yeah, uh, it happens all the time, uh, especially with the teams, you know, the, the kids changing. It's not just baseball, it's volleyball or it's soccer or what, what have you. But uh, very, very seldom are coaches completely happy. I mean, when you think about it, you put a showcase together and all these kids are stars and so they think they're stars. And all of a sudden, even if you put the best talent together, you have someone who has to hit seventh or eighth or ninth. And when a parent looks at it and says, why is my kid hitting seventh? Or why isn't he the starting pitcher? And then all these egos get involved. So even trying to put all these great athletes together isn't going to work. And it's so easy. Like I said, it's just so easy to move on to something else. What's the earliest age of a club team? Oh, they're, they're eight, nine years old now. All right. And so actually, am I correct in assuming that eight, nine-year-olds get cut from their club teams? Well, not only do they get cut from club teams, but they have to pay to try out in a lot of cases. In a soccer teams, baseball teams, whatever, you you got to pay maybe a $50, $75 fee just to try out. And that's not even making the team. So it, it, it's got to the point where, yes, I mean, we everything is a tryout now. Kids, and that leads to the other thing, that there's absolutely no loyalty. You can be on a team you can be the 11th or 12th kid on the team. You can go all the time, and the coach will say, hey, you know, you keep developing. Next year, you'll play more. You'll play more. Well, guess what? Next year, they'll have tryouts, and they have no problem cutting that kid that sat on the bench, paid his money, didn't get an opportunity, and they'll just replace him with somebody else. Maybe they think it's a little better. Recent weeks, we've seen situations develop in college basketball uh, with Adidas University of Louisville, and I'm very closely associated with that story for a number of reasons because I have seen the AAU and how the AAU basketball is run where these kids are like on auction. They're paraded around in a gymnasium as a 15- or 16-year-old sophomore or junior in high school which uh, desires to go to a college, and these colleges are on them. They're making deals right on the court. 
Well, it happens in basketball. It happens in all sports. You, you'll go to a, a travel team. Uh, these kids may travel 75, 100 miles to play. And you'll go to a game. Uh, parents don't even know each other. They don't even know who's on the team. I mean, th- these parents are just so out of whack with what really is going on and their expectations are so high, but someone tells them you go play for this team and you know, that's where they'll be seen. That's where coaches will see them. And that's, that's the other big thing that these coaches do to get kids to entice them to play. And that's a whole nother subject. Well, we're going to get right into it right, right now, because I want to, you know, it's almost a telepathy situation again, because I was going to ask you in regard to some of these bully coaches, you know, somebody says, well, he's a good coach because he wins. And I say, well, that doesn't make a good coach because you win. You're a good coach because you teach and you instill some, some important factors into these young adults. Well, yeah, the, the key thing is developing these kids, obviously. Anybody can win if they get the best talent. I mean, that doesn't really kind of prove anything about, about winning. But what, what happens is these coaches will get the kids, and basically, you know, they'll make a lot of promises. They'll overpromise a lot of times. Uh, all these coaches or a lot of these travel team coaches are paid. And, you know, what happens, uh, a, a perfect scenario would be you'll get a former uh, major league player or whatever, minor league player. He'll decide to start his own little program, and he'll, he'll start it, and he'll do very well, and everybody will love him, and he'll have his team, and he'll coach the team. And then what happens is he grows, and he grows fast, and he grows faster. More kids come and play for him, pay him money. And all of a sudden, he doesn't have the, the proper coaches to take care of all these teams. So he's kind of promised he'll be there, he'll do this, he'll do that. And then he's not around to be seen. He just can't be. And they just build and they grow and they grow too fast. And then all of a sudden, you'll start getting coaches in the summer for these summer travel teams that are no more than babysitters. You know, I'll pay you a couple grand. You you go play in six or seven tournaments, do this with the kids, keep them happy, keep the parents happy, and and that's it. You know, when we were growing up, and we can go back to era to era, and so, you know, you, can ever, you can't ever judge who's better, Maris or Mano, Mays, whatever. Uh, you compare. Baseball is all about comparing uh, athlete versus athlete. You can't compare era to era. But I want to ask you in regard, like, is there just too much program information in the brains of these kids today? Everything is now. Everything is with texting. Everything is with uh, right now being uh, that communication wave for them. Is there too much information blocked in their mind where when they come onto the field, uh, they just can't relieve themselves? Well, I think we live in an immediate gratification society, and that's really one of the big problems. If it doesn't happen now, you know, people aren't satisfied. So, therefore, coaches, they don't want to take two or three or four years to develop kids. What they will do is they'll let somebody else develop them, and then when they get good and they hear about them, they'll go and cherry pick them off of a team. And, you know, that's what's happened with all this travel ball. There's just way too much travel ball. The biggest problem in baseball is there's just too much travel ball. And there's, therefore, because there's so much travel ball, the expectations are too high. Okay, so now you have travel ball where that – it's almost year round, correct? Oh, it is. It's twelve months. The kids don't get any breaks. They can't rest their arms, which is another issue that we could get into. That they don't they don't get a break from playing. So, in other sports, and I think this is a big problem. And I wanted to address this problem for years because I've experienced it with some close family members that. A family member couldn't play football and basketball. He had to make a choice between one and the other. So now that all year round football mentality or you can only play one or the other, that sort of jeopardizes a kid's future. It absolutely jeopardizes his future. And if you'll listen to experts on, you know, what's going on with youth sports, kids should play different sports because you use different muscles. And again, when we were growing up, it was it was very common that people would use play three sports in high school, and now the kids can't. You know, you can't play summer baseball if you're a football player because they want you to work out with them, you want lift weights with them, and so forth. So, it's it's completely changed. What about some drug issues within the youth sports realm? Um, PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, maybe. Well, everybody is using something because right. there's so much pressure to do well and be well, and then. You know, if someone else over here is using something to get bigger and stronger and faster, you might think it's wrong, but you need to compete. And therefore, you feel the pressure to to compete with those people. So it, it's pretty much an epidemic. 
Jeff Potter is joining me on Sports Kids here as we take a look at the epidemic within youth sports and how we could better the lives of our sons, our daughters, our, our grandsons, our granddaughters, our nieces, and our nephews. Share with me any wild story that a parent might have come to you and suggested that you do or complain to you that was so out of bounds? Well, I, I, I laugh at those stories. And uh, I, I guess the first one that would come to mind, and I won't name names, but I, I take some kids to uh, Cooperstown every year. They're 12 year old kids, and I take three teams every year. The Hall of Fame. Yeah, and we play there for a week. And the way I put my teams together, I just kind of get kids from here and there. Rather than taking a team, I put team, uh, kids together. Again, almost like the tour where they just love and respect the game. They're not necessarily the best kids, but that gives them an opportunity to go to Cooperstown. Well, a couple of years ago, I was going to Cooperstown, and uh, one of the kids wanted to go on the uh, uh, with me, and the mother you know, let me know he'd, he'd love to go. So I said, that's fine. Well, what she started doing about two months before we went to Cooperstown, she started sending me videos of how good he was. And I would get videos twice a week about how good this ball player was and how, how well he could do things. And uh, I took the videos, and that was very cool. But that wasn't the, really the, the agenda for my teams. But it was nice that he was going to be a ball player. Well, he got up there. He did exceptionally well. And he was doing well. And, you know, he's hitting, whatever, 800 and doing pitching well and stuff like that. And uh, we got to about the fourth day of the tournament over there and for whatever reason he was a leadoff hitter whatever reason the coach decided to hit him ninth that game well she had a fit she had an absolute fit why is he betting ninth he's hitting so good he's doing this he's doing that oh my god this and that and uh, she came to me and she asked me you know why that was happening and I kind of explained to her well maybe you know he's hitting ninth today because maybe the coach wants to give another kid a chance to get a base hit. You know, he's done, he's proven himself, whatever. So she got a little upset at me about that. And then the next night uh, we had our little uh, pizza party for Cooperstown. And I kind of told the parents how I felt about, you know, youth baseball. And and I just said, look, your kids here, they're not going to play major league baseball. You know, we're here just to have fun and develop and all that stuff. Well, she took that statement that he's not going to play major league baseball that I ruined his career. Now here's a 12 year old kid and she's screaming at me that because I made the statement that he probably won't make play major league baseball, that I somehow messed up his whole career. She was so into, you know, succeeding and this kid being so good and and, and the expectations were absolutely ridiculous. And so, and the, the whole part of the irony of the story was that, you know, by him going to Cooperstown, he saw the other people, and he did kind of fell in some ways, and it kind of put things in perspective that you might be a really good ball player in your area, but there's a lot of competition out there. So you shouldn't be driving your kids to worry about playing Major League Baseball. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If your kid's good enough, they'll find them. But the whole point is all this stuff that we should be teaching these kids about the right life lessons and leadership and teamwork and confidence and things like that but she was just so out of that i had actually destroyed this kid's career because they said he might not play major league baseball where has all those items that you just mentioned where have they gone oh they're gone they're, they're absolutely gone where no we're, respect well there's very little respect and the, the other thing is there's very discipline well there's no discipline there's no loyalty because no one's loyal to a team i mean you you it's not uh, uncommon for me to see parents have their kids play in seven, eight, nine different organizations over the course of their youth baseball. They move them and move them from year to year because they're not happy. So you don't build any loyalty to the players, to the coaches, to the to the community. Yes or no? Youth sports has it been adultified? Meaning what? Meaning have the adults gotten into the realm of youth sports and they are now controlling youth sports rather than the kids playing the game and playing for the game rather than playing for their adult fathers, mothers, whoever. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the parents are the the biggest problem with youth sports. Parents, then coaches, then the kids. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been that way for a, a long time. There's a place that I read this week where that the city has actually granted 
a special place called a silent section of of a baseball field where that the parents have to stand or sit in this silent section and they can't say a word during the game. Well, I, I've heard of that. I've also heard of a city which has actually banned parents from coming to the games. I mean, that is a legit thing, and it happens more than people realize that you know that is the, that is the biggest problem and yeah there there is situations unless they're gonna quote cheer for the other team they can't say a word and yeah there's there's silent sections and that kind of tells you where we've been so you you lead me again into my next frame of thought and my next frame of thought is that the parents you know how do we rectify the situation and how damaging are they well it's extremely damaging when kids are stopping playing athlete athletic uh, at the age of 13 and 14. And, you know, not only have they stopped playing ball and they're burned out playing ball, but now when you think about it, they haven't gained any confidence because they feel kind of like they're a failure that we, I played sports and, and I'm not playing sports anymore. And I think that we got to get back to, you know, really the, the important things, which is, the, the leadership, the discipline, the respect for the kids, the, the self-confidence of the kids, give the game back to the kids. You know, there was a situation on the tour maybe four years ago where I had run a clinic for the kids, and it was hilarious because I, you know, we ran a clinic for two hours. We always run free clinics on the tour, and usually after the clinic's over, the kids don't want to leave. They just have some fun. They want to stay. So there must have been 80 kids there, and... Uh, I said, who wants to stay and play a little pickup game? And about 40 kids put their hands up, a half of them. And I said, well, you know, get against the fence over there, and we'll count you out on two fields, and we'll count one to four. And so they, they counted out one through four, and we had about uh, 40 kids, 10 kids on a team. And I told, you know, all the ones and twos, you know, you go over to this field, and threes and fours, you go over to this field and, and play some ball. Well, I was almost attacked by about five or six adults. Like, well, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? Who's going to umpire? Who's going to coach? Who's going to, who's going to do what? Now these are small kids. And I said, you know, just let them play ball. Just leave them alone. And sure enough, the kids went on the fields. They figured it out. They picked up teams. They figured out who was going to bat first, how many outs, who was going to call out safe. Like we used to do when we did the pickup games as kids. Mm -hmm. So it's still out there. The kids can still do this, but the parents don't give it to them. And that's the problem. When we were kids, parents, let us be kids. They let us grow up. They let us learn from each other and teach each other. Now, these kids can't teach each other. They can't learn from each other. They're afraid to make a mistake. You know, the coach, the coach is yelling at them, screaming at them, doing this, doing that. They're afraid to make a mistake. Dad's, you know, right in the middle of a, a kid batting. He's, he's telling the kid how to hit. You know, you know, put your swing here. I can't believe this. You ought to be able to hit the ball. I mean, the, you know, it's, it's just absolutely terrible. And I was at a game must have been a couple of years ago where parents on competing sides started to get into it. And I'm thinking like, w w what are their children thinking? I mean, how embarrassed is Johnny on the lions or Billy on the tigers? Uh, what are they thinking when they see they're, they're looking in the stands and they're seeing their father yelling at the, the rival across the way. I mean, what's going on here? Well, they're not only yelling at the other team and parents getting into it, but when you think about it, there's there's hundreds of thousands of kids that on the ride home, the parents are complaining about the coach, and they're sitting in the back, and you wonder what they're thinking then. The coach should have done this. The coach should have done that. Why didn't he pitch? I can't believe this. Screaming, yelling, swearing. What do kids think when their own parents don't have respect for their coaches? How can they respect their coaches? You know, you brought me right back to my childhood because that happened with my father. I could remember a game where I scored 32 points. We went to overtime. We were playing in Newcastle against St. Vitus, uh, the CYO League, which was just as tough as any any high school league in, in western Pennsylvania because those kids from Newcastle were very strong. And I could remember like I was so deadbeat tired. And on the way home, I could remember my father talking about the three passes that I threw away and the turnovers that I made. I'm thinking, here I put everything on the line, but the ride home, these kids have to deal with that voice on the long ride home where they're just going to be a shell of themselves. Well, well, they are, and you're absolutely right about the ride home, about the coaches and that, but also how the parents 
really give their kids a hard time about some of the mistakes they made. And my goodness, you know, these kids are out giving 100%. They're trying their best. And for them to feel the pressure of their parents giving them a hard time. But it is, again, that vicious cycle because what happens is there's so much pressure for the kids to excel now. So many showcase and travel teams. So many things that you got to do this and you got to stay up with Billy and that. So, first of all, while they're playing, there's so much pressure on them. But then after the game, they get that. And, you know, when we were kids, you know, it wasn't like that. Yeah, it wasn't like that. And it's really changed very abruptly and very quickly. And for a number of reasons, because I personally think that uh, youth sports have become professionalized in a lot of ways. I mean that you have these kids that are, are being told, hey, if you just stay with the program that I'm putting you on, you're going to go to a big-time school. And when you go to these AAU, I'm talking about a basketball uh, a youth sport team, and when you go and see some of these, they come out, they're so entitled. They have the, the brand-new gear. They have the brand-new shoes all given to them. These kids really don't have to work anything, and then they're getting the idea put in their head that they're going to be a blue chipper. Well, they are. And in baseball, it's a little different than that, but they have basically what they call – you know, showcases. And, and what they do is they get a couple hundred kids to come to a college or whatever for a weekend. And there's a whole bunch of college coaches and scouts and all that. And the problem is that these coaches, they will tell basically the kids on the summer team, I can get you seen. I can get you seen. That's the big thing with the coaches. You come and play for me. I can get you seen. I know people. I know coaches. These, they don't know coaches. <laughs> they say they know coaches. And, and as a parent that you feel pressured to put your kid on the team because boy, my goodness, if this coach can get my kid seen and do this for him, then I need to play for him. And these coaches are being paid, correct? Uh, most of the summer teams, the travel teams are, are getting paid. And you know, when you, when you add up the numbers and look at the math, you know, a lot of these travel teams, you're paying 15, 18, two thousand dollars a kid you get you get 15 kids that's 30 grand they play six or seven tournaments and pay some umpires a little and this and that you do the math a lot of money is going into their pockets you know when you bring this tour into fruition and you travel to different states and you travel to different cities and you're around these kids the responsibility is, is a great responsibility for you Share with us any stories that Johnny or Mike might have come up to you and talked about their parents. Well, you, you get a lot of kids on the on the tour that do talk to me about their parents. What, what do they say? Well, the biggest thing about the, the kids, first of all, the, the biggest reason kids don't go on the tour is the parents. Why? Well, my thought is that the parents, in their own way, hate to let their kid go for 31 days without believing that they really need them. And it's absolutely amazing when kids get out there on their own, you know, what they can accomplish and what they can do. It's amazing. Really amazing. Now you came up with this idea. I think that, uh, your motto is passion, uh, respect. What is it? Uh, passion, hard work, respect, and selflessness. Okay. So the passion is there. The, the passion got to be there. You, yeah. can't, you can't do anything in life unless you have a passion right. to do it. And most of these kids have a passion. They do. Okay. And it's a, a legitimate passion. It's a passion that they love and respect the game. It's a passion they want to go out and have fun. It's a, it's a passion to go on the tour that they feel that they might want to give back to society. You know, we, we, the big thing with us is giving back. So, uh, you know, we want kids that we feel that will go on the tour that have those type of passions. Yes. The respect factor. Well, we, we expect these kids to respect everybody on the tour, uh, whether it's their, their parents traveling a little or the coaches or, or anywhere they go. Because we go to about 30 different towns, every day that we're in a town, there's a lot of communication. There's a lot of people around. They have to deal with people. They have to talk to people. And as you know, teenagers now, they, don't, they want to play on their phone. They don't want to talk. So Correct. We get them in front of people, and they, they learn to be respectful. They'll start opening the door. They'll, they'll ask. They'll feed the, the parents first. They'll be very, very nice and respectful, and uh, they learn those things. What has been your biggest takeaway from the Potter Tour? I, I think the biggest takeaway is the kids and the fact that you know kids are not lazy. We sometimes think kids are lazy. I, I think kids will work as hard as we motivate them to work 
But you have to motivate them to work. If you don't motivate them, they'll look like they're lazy. But kids, it's incredible what they can accomplish if you allow them to accomplish it. So in bringing everything together, how do we rectify and fix the present situation of youth sports? Very few, unlike you and I, uh, will come and try to make a change. I'm real involved in making a change because I see these kids. These kids are great kids. Uh, they're losing it. They're losing it in a big way. It could be too much uh, parental influence. It could be entitlement. Uh, it, it could be just peer pressure. It could be a lot of different elements that enter into the equation. However, I still don't want to give up on them because most of them are beautiful children of God and they have a good heart and their heart is pure and it, and it's not a biased heart until they get involved with the pettiness of competition between maybe different families. Well, I, I think the big thing with the kids is, is the parents. And I think the only way this is going to get rectified to any degree is the parents understand the expectations and they understand what's really, really important. And little Johnny whether they think it or not, he's gonna, he's not going to go as far in baseball as he thinks he is. And if Johnny's done playing ball at 15 and all he's learned to do is hit a ball, you failed. But if you teach him these life lessons and he's done playing baseball at 15, then he has all these things going for him going into life about the leadership, the confidence, and things like that. Jeff Potter is joining me. I'm Felix Taverna. This is Sports Kids, and we're talking about the issues and the dilemma that's plaguing youth sports let me bring you right up to the moment, and I want to ask you, perhaps, could you be a psychologist right now? Oh, I'd love to. Okay, so analyze this situation. LeVar Ball with Lonzo Ball, and then LiAngelo Le- Ball going over into China and then stealing the, the sunglasses and being held by uh, Chinese authorities. What do you think... Lonzo Ball feels about his father. They say, oh, I have a great relationship with my son. My son knows I'm all for him. He's the greatest, blah, 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 blah. But is there an embarrassment factor to somewhere that he might be hiding? Well, I I think there's a tremendous pressure there. There has to be. And, you know, we all want to make our parents happy. The kids want to make their happy. We're trying to go out there and make our kids happy. The kids are trying to make us happy. The kids want us, you know, to be proud of them and so forth and so on. But there's obviously exactly what we've been talking about. Here's a here's a parent who basically has put so much pressure on his kid that the the kid really doesn't know how to act or what to do or is scared to make a mistake or something like that. That's what that's everything that we've been speaking about here. And that's probably the perfect example of what is really the problem with youth sports now. It, it is that parent who has put so much pressure on the kid, who's made it about him and not the kid. And I just can't see this kid having having fun or learning the proper life lessons. He may make a lot of money, but there's obviously a huge problem there. All right, eight years the Potter Tour originates out of your your home state of Maryland, and uh, the first year you went to how many states? Uh, we went to we actually went to uh, four states, the same four states the first year. I mean, obviously less less towns in each state, but we we got to four states. How many how many boys? We had sixteen boys the first year. Okay, second year. Second year, uh, we uh, we actually ran two tours, so we had about twelve kids on each uh, tour. Uh, the third and fourth year, we we split it up and had a couple of teams. We've gone back to having one tour only because I've been running into this situation where the kids that play football, they got to be back by a certain time. See? They, yep, absolutely. So they can't even go on a fun tour right. in, in the summer. And uh, so we've gone and we've made it the month of July, which makes it simple there. It's 31 days. And uh, basically, the next year, we're looking for the first time to have two teams on the same tour not two different tours. So that'll be interesting. I have about 30 kids interested in going. So 
that's building. But the biggest improvement we've had on the tour is the parents, the families. And as I have spoken to you today, the big thing about parents, you get the right parents and you can accomplish wonderful things. You can. When you get those parents that, that quote, get it right and understand and, uh, that's really, really when it starts working. And uh, I have a couple parents that always say, you know, just just go on the tour and, and let the process work. You know, we have a mutual friend, and I would be extremely remiss not to mention the mayor of our city, Elwood City, Pennsylvania, Anthony Tony Court, one of my lifelong friends. And you had an opportunity to go back. You got the key to the city and you were able to bring your tour back to Elwood City, your hometown. Your thoughts? Oh, I mean, there's nothing like going back home. I mean, there's just nothing like it. Uh, I I grew up in Elport, which is a little town. Well, it's, it's part of Elwood City, but it's a little town off of Elwood City. and uh, Not a town, like a little <laughs> a dot. It's a dot. It's okay. a dot. But Elwood City was no, two dots. But I, I grew up playing ball there. Uh, it's now called Sheeler Field because of Joe Sheeler. He was, right. my, he was my little league coach. Mrs. Sheeler is still there. She's 95 years old. and every, God bless her. Every year when we go back and she hears that the tour is coming to Elwood, we'll go to the field and we'll look over and she's sitting out there waiting for us. And there's nothing like seeing Mrs. Sheeler every year, going to J&T every year. Going, right. Going the customer the stamp for oh, those absolutely. Who- J&T is a custard stand for those of you. You had to be a part of the, the fraternity to understand what JT was all about. Yeah, it was there when we were kids, and we went there after the games, and we still go there. I take the tour there every year, and we go to J&T. And, uh, but just to be back in Elwood, it, it's just incredible. And I know I go to Sheeler Field, and I talk about it, and I'm all excited, and I know the kids probably don't care, but it doesn't matter because I'm really in my zone there. And, you know, played baseball there, and it's, it's just great going back And home. you remember – uh, that Joe Sheeler, whose uh, son was Pete Sheeler, which was a great athlete in his own right. And you came from a real solid baseball family uh, with your brother, Rich, who was, uh, I thought, was one of the hardest hitting catchers I've ever laid eyes on. But going back to Sheeler Field in Alport, Pennsylvania, I can recall another good friend that will be listening to Sport Kids when we air this production. His name was Guy DeMeo. And Guy DeMeo was Mr. Softball in Mahoning Town. And remember, Sheeler Field had all the softball down there, right? Oh, my goodness, yeah. It, it, was, just, it was just great. Baseball, softball, softball whatever. It, but there was nothing like back home. And, and we know so many mutual friends that, you know, not only him, but like someone like Larry Kelly that we played ball with. And, and he's from Newcastle, and now he's in Elwood. And, uh, you know, I have some high school buddies that still play baseball. The super attorney with uh, <laughs> with uh, Ed Prince, you know, a guy that you graduated with and uh, came from nearby Koppel to play a stellar shortstop position for the Elwood City Wolverines. But let me ask you this, and we talk about this, and this is one of the, as we wind it up here and get into the home stretch, so to speak, what I want to share with uh, with our audience and what I want your thoughts was that, you know, we keep on going, well, that's the way it was when we were that way. And it's never going to be that way again. And one of the things that was uh, obvious and present in our day was the fact that the coaches, they taught you. They had a game plan on nurturing and developing your talents, like the late coach Bill Spellman, who you played under, and how I have patterned any type of coaching that I've ever done under his fundamentals. It's just not there anymore, is it? Uh, no, it isn't. And, and coaches like Coach Sheeler and Coach Spellman, they're, they're way in the past. And uh, we're not going to get a lot of coaches like that again. But hopefully that uh, – you know, we can teach some of these coaches to have have those kind of attributes and, and be able to work with these kids and teach them the right life lessons. I want to steal this quote from somebody who wrote this, and I want your thoughts in regard to it. Jeff Potter is joining us. He's from the Potter Tour. He's really involved with uh, developing and bringing our youth, our boys and girls, our men and women our young adults into a reality situation of youth sports, which the deck might be stacked against them for a number of reasons in which well, we just shared with you over the period of this production. But nevertheless, let me say this and let me read this. And I thought this was almost gospel 
And so I couldn't wait to bring it to you and get your thoughts. And it, it reads like this. We say nothing. We do not demand a change. We simply complain. And then we watch our kids burn out. Well, yeah, it, it's funny you say that because I remember when I was, before I got involved in, in baseball uh, again, and uh, my wife would say to me, I would watch my little boy play ball, and he Eric was, uh, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old, and I would sit on the sidelines, and I didn't quite like what was going on there, but I'd put the newspaper in front of my face because I didn't want to say anything. And my wife would come over to me and say, shouldn't he be doing that? And shouldn't he be doing that? And I would look at her and I'd say, he's a coach. I'm not. And until I get back to coach and really, I don't really have a right to say something. So my point is, you know, parents get involved, get back involved. I mean, what's important is you're right. I mean, it's so easy to complain and like we're sitting here and we don't like the way things are, but you know something, if you want to change things, you need to get involved. And it's so important to get involved in what we're doing. You're, and, go ahead. And you can get involved in many, many ways. So you don't have to be this big coach to get involved and stuff like that. But what you can do is get involved in some way with your kids, volunteer in some way. And the tour is about that a lot. Not only getting involved in the baseball part of it, but getting involved with the community service and the charity work and things we do and, and show up. My goodness, show up and be there and be part of the process. I want to get back to a question that I asked you, and I don't know if you'd answered it to my liking or not, but I'm going to go ahead and give you another opportunity. Okay. You can go ahead and have another pitch at it. We'll give it a shot. Okay. When kids come to you and they talk about their parents, I know, and I could almost reflect me asking you this question or feeling the same way when I was growing up. What is it about their parents that prevents a kid to giving his best and prevents him from just being out there? What's some of the stories that a kid might have come up to you and said, you know, I'm really nervous because my father's always yelling at me on the way home. Well, you know, one one of the things I've heard from several kids when I've asked them what could be better at a game, you know, what could help them at a game. And several said to me, my dad, stay home. Huh. My dad, stay home. Uh, and I've heard that more than once from kids. And I think the first part of that is the pressure that parents put on their kids. I think that's. That's absolutely the, the biggest problem that the kids have. But when they come up, you know, they don't want to disappoint. They don't want to disappoint their parents. And they, they feel a tremendous, you know, pressure to succeed. And another thing that happens, though, is the parents very, very seldom ask their kids. I hear parents all the time. We're going to this team. We're going to that team. We're, we're doing this. We're doing that. And I'll, I'll say, well, what's Johnny think about this? And it's like... <laughs> Johnny wasn't asked. Right, exactly. They just want to play baseball. They don't care about what team they're playing for, what organization, this and that. They just want to play ball. And when you think about it, dad, usually dads, sometimes moms, but dads, they take them away from their team because they they think it's better. But they never ask their kid if it's better. And this poor kid is going from team to team to team because dad thinks it's better. Very seldom do the parents really ask the kids what they think and what they feel. And I think that would go a long way to help. And you're absolutely 150% correct because my thought exactly, my sentiments exactly is that these adults may be a mother or a father. I'll go ahead and give the benefit of the doubt to the moms who being a little bit less spoken but not in the case of your wife because <laughs> she was always asking you but a father trying to live in his kid's shoes and taking over and infringing on that young boy or girl from giving her best because he thinks he knows best well, yeah, and it's a lot of the what we call the ex-jocks that are living through their kids, that they didn't get as far as they wanted to get. They didn't do what they wanted to do. They didn't accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. So they're out there doing it through their kids. 
And there's nothing wrong with wanting the best for your kids or wanting your kid to do as well as you did, but you have to ask them what they want. You know, you have to, they have to be part of the process of what's going on. And so they don't like the current situation. And so they become over the top parents and some of them don't know how to stop and they will get to where they believe they need to go at any cost. Yeah, and I, I've seen even coaches, mild-mannered coaches, you know, it gets in their blood. The winning gets in their blood. The competition gets in their blood. And, and, and it's so easy to allow that to get the best of you. And you want your kid to do well. And when you see another kid maybe doing better than your kid, you're going to do anything possible to to give your kid the opportunity to succeed. And sometimes that's just a little too much. All right, now you have a son. I do. He played uh, major major college baseball university of maryland he did he played four years at maryland he got drafted by the oakland a's he played a year in the minor leagues okay did he um ever tune you out uh very seldom did he tune me out but i i think and again this is going to sound a little egotistical but very seldom did i tune him out uh i never really i don't think pressured him too much he was never the best kid on the team he was always a small kid growing up uh, so he was never the best. Uh, I coached him a lot, and uh, instead of giving him the more opportunities than other kids, I probably sat him more uh, than than other ones. Uh, I wanted him to learn the right life lessons. And uh, you know what happened was when he was eleventh grade in high school, and he was a pretty good pitcher, but he was small. He grew seven inches, and all of a sudden now he's big, he's strong, he's fast, and he can do the things that he wanted to do. So he. He went and had a great year, and, and Maryland won. But the point being is that growing up, he loved the game. He loved the game. He just loved playing baseball. He was the one kid who would come to me and say, Dad, did you see how far he hit the ball? Did you see how he struck it? He was always giving other people credit. He was always happy for other people, and I thought that was kind of neat. So I, I don't think – he never tuned me out, but, you know, I never tuned him out. You know, I have a friend who uh, his daughter tuned him out. She's a great tennis player, and he was an all-American tennis player. And I was watching him send her through some drills, and I was watching the interaction, and I saw that he was extremely tough on his young girl, tough, making her do things over and over repetitiously. It was a tough love. And I said to him, you know, I would never tell you how to – communicate with your daughter but i would step back a little bit and let her breathe and he said well what do you mean i said well you're putting too much pressure on her and there's going to come a time when she's not going to want to talk to you anymore and he says do you have any children at that time i didn't have a child i have a a young nine-year-old boy and i um said uh no i don't he goes Well, then you really don't know. And I said, well, you know, I've coached for 15 years on 7th and 8th grade basketball levels. I have four kids that have gone to the NBA. So I know uh, what talent looks like and how to, you know, prepare talent. Maybe not on a grand scale, but, you know, I'm a little bit better than maybe most, okay? Well, a year later, we catch up and he said, you know, you were right. My daughter hasn't talked to me in two years. And I said, well, I just sense that. I'm sorry to hear that, but that's how it should, you know, it should be. The the fathers, the mothers have to give that sport back, to, give any sport back to the young adults that are playing it. Until we do that, we're not going to be able to rectify and just cure the situation of this epidemic. So bring me up to date. You have another book that's going to be released in April of 2018. I do. I've been working on a book for some time, and through the tour, I get a whole lot of more, uh, I guess, experience about what I want to uh, write about. The The name of the book is called Far From Being Done, and that was kind of our motto on the tour this year, that, you know, although we've gone out there and I think accomplished a lot of stuff through baseball, through the communities, giving back and so forth, we've raised a lot of money for different charities, but I always tell the kids we're far from being done. You're far from being done. We're all far from being done. We all have so much more 
that we can accomplish and we need to accomplish. And you can never kind of sit on your laurels. You always have to want to have something else you want to do. You know, that's what the passion's all about. You want to, you want to get up every morning and say, you know, what can I do to help this person? Or maybe I can help that person. So we try to instill that in all of our kids and all of our parents and everybody involved with the tour. You know, we're all really far from being done, far from accomplishing what we need to. The president of our network, Wade Taylor, would probably address this question to you in closing. Uh, what has been your biggest biggest accomplishment? Give me a testimony from somebody who went through the tour that wrote to you or called you or commented or you know, relied on you or asked you for your advice or anything of that magnitude. Well, I think the big, biggest story is, is my Evan Kalinske story. Uh, Evan went on the tour when he was 13 years old. His first year he was on the tour. He's now been on every year since this will be his sixth year. He's in college now, but Evan, uh, we were, we were in, in a place and we were doing some community service and Evan was kind of a shy kid. And, uh, anyways, he was getting kind of picked on and we had a uh, little meeting after, after we did the community service. And I kind of gave a, a hard time to the guys picking on him. Then I gave a harder time to the other people who didn't kind of come to Evan's defense. And the last thing I did, I looked at Evan and I gave him the hardest time. And I said, how long are you going to take this? There and only there, when he started crying, did he say he was bullied in school and this and that. I'll make this a short story. Evan used to go on the tour and pitch, and he would always complain about everything. He'd never get more than an inning in. My leg hurts, my knee hurts, my arm hurts. This this happened that day. And I said, how long are you going to take this? And he looked at me and said, never again, never again. Two two days later, we're playing a game. Evan's scheduled to pitch. He pitches the first inning. He pitches the second inning. He pitches the fourth inning. He pitches the fifth inning. And all of a sudden, a kid comes walking up to me and says, uh, I, listen, I, I, I can go in and pitch. I'm ready. Evan comes up and looks at him and says, I got this. He says he's never been bullied since that day. And now he's five years on the tour, all the confidence in the world, going to West Virginia. And that day on that tour, when he said to me, never again, that, uh, that that's kind of one of many, many stories. You have to feel really gratified and fulfilled of touching these young boys and bringing them out of their environment and taking them. And some of them might never be out of the state of Maryland or out of their home state. They might never be able to go into a PNC park. They might not go to uh, Cooperstown for would see the hall of fame. Do you have any idea of how much joy that you have brought into these young adults lives? Well, I, I, I think so only because I, I get a lot of, uh, uh, letters from them. Uh, several kids have used uh, the tour as their little paper to get into college, uh, where they've been asked, you know, what one thing in your childhood changed you from being a child to an adult. And we've had people actually speak on the tour. I've had many, many parents come to me and say, you know, because of you, my kid's still playing ball. Because of you, he has this opportunity. Because of the tour and what you what you taught him, kind of the tough love, you know, he's doing this. So, so we get a lot of that stuff, and and it's just it makes me feel good, and it, it it's one of the reasons I like to get up every day and just be, really be inspired to help people. So, in closing, Jeff Potter has been our guest here on Sports Kids, the Potter Tour, his third book, ready to uh, hit. The marketplace in April 2018. So as we close, Jeff, 90% of these kids are great kids. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You you always get the 10% that aren't. But you know something? Them being on the tour teaches the other kids anyway. So it's all good. It's all good who comes on the tour. But 90%, absolutely. These are, these are great kids. They come back. They come back a little better kid. Before we let you go. And I thank you so much. It's great catching up. I think this has been brilliant. And I've been doing radio for a long time. And I want to thank Wade Taylor, WS Radio, Richie inside the studio, producing uh, this broadcast. We appreciate you. This is Sports Kids. Share with us how people can get involved. I know that you have thrown a larger net over your tour. You got some, you're doing some business out here in San Diego where people can get a hold of you and any other information. 
Well, the easiest thing is just Google Jeff Potter Baseball. If you Google Jeff Potter Baseball, my website comes up there, my contact information, a lot of stuff about what we've done on the tour in the past, pictures and things like that. You can find me on Facebook, uh, Jeff Potter. Uh, the Potter Baseball Tour is on the Facebook. There's there's thousands of pictures of things we do, not only the baseball, but all the towns we go to, the community service, the charity work, things like that. So all my information's there. Any kid 13 to 15 years old that would like to go on the tour, there's not tryouts. We don't go the best. We just want good kids. And I'll tell you what, I'd love to have a kid from out here come on my tour. Yeah, we'll find you some. Richie, you got any eligibility? Are you 15 inside the studio? <laughs> Richie used to be a, a professional baseball player as well. A very, very good baseball player here in the San Diego area. Went to a school that was dominant in winning championships. Jeff Potter has been my guest. This has been the debut production of Sport Kids. Trying to identify the problems within youth sports and how we can correct them. How we could give more emphasis on doing it the right way for jeff potter the potter tour i'm felix taverna this has been sports kids we appreciate you listening and we will check in with you at our next available moment